Hey guys, um, this is just a short video to talk about why we use non-parametric statistics, how normal things work, why some things aren't normal, um, and it should get you going on things. So let me share my screen. It should take me out of the picture because you don't need to see me. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the question is really, why are we doing these interesting, uh, weird, different rank order tests, especially on data um, coming from surveys using Likert scales? And so to do that, um, let me just explain a little bit about um, what's going on normally. So um, you guys know that most statistics that you learned in Stat 190 and, I don't know, 330, most all the other regular stat classes you have, assume that normal is the way to go. Um, so normal statistics are the ones where um, we can make this assumption. And it turns out two things. First, lots of things that happen in the world, many natural phenomenon, things in ecology, things in the human body, um, follow the normal distribution. In a way, it makes sense because of this idea, you have a clump near the middle and you have a very small number of outliers that go off to extremes. Um, if you've ever been at the Science Museum, um, I think actually both St. Louis and Kansas City, their science museums, heck, the uh, Field Museum in Chicago has one too. That thing where kind of sand drops or little balls and it kind of makes a normal uh, distribution out of the data. So it turns out that the normal assumption just works pretty well for lots of things. The second thing going on is the central limit theorem. And I know some of you have a stronger math background and some of you uh, don't care about the math at all. But the general idea that the central limit theorem is just generally sweet um, is a thing that works very well. So the central limit theorem says if you're doing two things, the concept of interest is the sample mean and your sample sizes are large enough, which actually isn't super large, right? That's one of the things you learn in Stat 190 is that 30 is plenty. For a lot of things, 10 is enough. But if that's the case, then the mean will typically have a sampling distribution that follows the normal distribution, even when the data itself doesn't follow the normal distribution like we saw in a lot of those natural phenomenon. So because of that, most normal statistics, normal in both senses of the word, things like t-test and over-regression, they apply in lots and lots of situations and the normal distribution works fine. Um, you can go to Wikipedia and read about the central limit theorem if you're into that. But we also know that a lot of things don't follow the normal distribution. Um, the two that I always think of, one are surveys about abortion, that it's not like there's a normal curve and most people are in the middle. It's that there are two extreme positions. Um, if you make a nine-point scale, the largest one is actually um, the pro-choice um, eight out of nine, if you're thinking about that. Um, but then the second largest one is like three. And that's really interesting. And, you know, why abortion is such an interesting thing to talk about and why there's such strife about it in the United States and elsewhere. Um, the other one that you think about is income, that you can see that this is uh, household income from a few years ago. And you can see that it actually has of this uh, Poisson distribution, we call it. And what it is, is that, um, the median is not where the pump is in the middle. The mean is actually uh, farther down because outliers pull that uh, there. Um, you know, if you were in class, you would have heard me say that, um, you know, Elon Musk probably is over in Thousand Hill State Park because, you know, on a graph like the size I was drawing in class, a billion, you know, a hundred billion dollars is uh, way the heck outside of the room where we're drawing it. So we have to think about what we're doing in those other times. So sometimes we can use the central limit theorem anyway and just say, well, let's think about the mean, even though that's not really a good thing. But wouldn't it be cool if you could just not do that? And so this idea that when your assumptions are met, parametric tests are the best, you should do normal things um, like you do in those other classes. But in cases where the assumptions are not met, that parametric uh, doge gets pretty weak pretty quickly. So what helps us with this is the idea that we're assuming that the sample is like the population. Now, I drew this in class just the other day, but it's true. I draw it in almost every class I teach. But this idea that we always assume that the sample looks like the population. And if we don't, we got bigger trouble 
to worry about. So what we do is we think about ordinal variables. So ordinal variables are just um, where we can clearly um, delineate whether something is larger or smaller than something else. So in survey questions, you can imagine strongly agree, agree, neutral. We don't care about the distance between the terms. I'm making uh, squishy uh, hand motions, but I have my camera turned off so you can't see it. Um, but that idea that we can order things from smallest to biggest. Smallest to biggest is our custom. We just do it so it always goes in the same direction. Um, but um, that makes it so we can do that. So you have to know whether you're playing you know, golf or football, whether a big number is good or bad. But um, we do that. The other thing we do is for ties, we assign the average rank. So if you look at the data set here on the screen, um, I have these eight numbers that go from 1 to 20. But they're not normal at all. And in fact, there's nothing between 3 and 14. And it's, of course, super easy to rank them from smallest to biggest. Notice that there are 215, so they each get five and a half in our uh, ranked data set. Now, when you do this, of course, you're losing information. And the question is, does that matter? How important is it? Am I messing stuff up by doing that? So in this case, the fact that there's a huge gap between 3 and 14 could be really, really important, or it could be just an artifact of how we're asking the question. It could be um, something totally not useful to us at all. And especially in ordinal variables, where it was somewhat arbitrary whether we made five categories or seven or nine, it's easy to imagine that these spaces between numbers aren't very important at all. So what we do then is we're converting all of these numbers from um, whatever weird shape it has, like this is that income shape, and we're converting it to a rectangle because now we're just taking 100 million households and putting them from smallest to biggest um, on the scale. I didn't draw a picture of a rectangle. I guess I could have. And rectangles are awesome, right? If you think about calculus, you spend half the first semester of calculus figuring out how to make really weird curves look like a bunch of skinny, skinny rectangles. And that idea that you're making them skinnier and skinnier until we've beaten our function with a stick enough that it looks like a rectangle. Um, we have to compute the area under them because that's what probability is, right? There's an integral involved. Well, the area of rectangles is the easiest one, right? Of all the, all the areas I can calculate, the area of rectangles is great. You could even... Um, imagine if I have n data points, the probability of each of them is 1 over n. Well, n times 1 over n equals 1, and that's the kind of math I can do all freaking day. So this idea that non-parametric data allows us to transform our weird data set, whether it's something like this or abortion data or surveys about using AI in class or about why students pick Truman or any of the things we do surveys about, we convert it to a rectangle, and then we can do these cool rank tests. So every test we have has a non-parametric analog. So things like t-tests, um, things like ANOVA, things like linear regression, um, even more complicated tests, uh, logistic regression, all those kind of things have non-parametric analogs. And so from that, um, we really can um, figure out what's um, going on and what we're doing with that. So. Um, with that, that's a quick introduction to nonparametrics and why we're doing them um, in this class. And when we get to our next uh, meeting, we're going to talk about two of those tests. One is the chi-squared, which looks at counts of things. And then we're going to look more generally at these rank tests where we're going to take our data and rank it. So there you go.